Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Keener, and I'm director of the Bridging Health and Healthcare Portfolio at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I have the privilege of welcoming you all to this Google Hangout, along with our friends from Academy Health. Um, first of all, we just want to apologize for the technical difficulties, but we're pleased to bring this program to you. And I know that all of us are really excited uh, and are looking forward to hearing about um, this important study that looked at innovations in public health around the world and really trying to understand um, how we can apply those learnings to um, our work here in the United States. The purpose of a Google Hangout is really to make sure that not only we convey information, but that we have a chance to interact with all of you. And so I want to remind you that um, you can send questions in using the chat box that is on the right-hand side of your screen, or please use the Twitter handle, hashtag GlobalPopHealth, all one word, GlobalPopHealth, to send your questions in. And you can send those in at any time as, as we're getting underway here. So over the course of my career, I've had the pleasure of working for both state and local public health um, for many, many years. And like so many of you, um, we have been practicing in a very difficult, challenging environment. The challenges are coming at us from many directions, whether they're fiscal or some of the, the changes in our health policy environment with uh, health care reform. And so we really have multiple things that we're trying to balance and address in public health today. Um, here at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we have been completely dedicated to improving the quality and impact of public health for decades, um, starting back in the early 90s with the Turning Point Project and continuing on through work um, most recently around uh, public health systems and services research, uh, public health law, uh, public health leadership, both at state and local levels, um, health impact assessment, just a lot of very important work over the years. And this work has continued and has deepened as we have embraced a vision here at the foundation of building a culture of health in the United States. And this is a very bold idea of, of really making health a central core social value so that all of us in our very diverse society in the United States are able to have longest and healthiest lives that we possibly can um, and that this can start now and continue for generations to come. It's within this context of building a culture of health that first of all we know it's not going to be a, a short-term project. Um, it's going to take time, it's going to take effort, perseverance, and it's really going to take all of us from all sectors in our society to make this happen. We also know that we can learn so much from each other, but also from people across the globe. And that's why we thought that this project was so important, and we asked Academy Health to um, put together a study looking at innovations in public health across the world in order to identify what we can learn from those innovations and those practices here in the United States. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Margot Edmonds from the Academy Health, and thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Thanks, Paul, for that very warm welcome, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. I'd particularly like to take an opportunity to thank the Foundation for funding this study and to thank our program officer, Katie Weir, who was an amazing work partner every step of the way along this study. As Paul said, my name is Margo Edmonds. I'm Vice President for Evidence Generation and Translation at Academy Health here in Washington, D.C. Today I'm joined by a distinguished panel, panel of public health professionals in Seattle, Atlanta, and the U.K. And over the next hour or so, I'm going to be moderating a free-flowing discussion about how the public health systems around the world can help inform and improve what we do here in the U.S. 
Although the U.S. spends more on health care than any other nation, we know that spending more money doesn't necessarily translate to better outcomes. In fact, we know that citizens in other countries that spend a lot less than we do actually live longer and healthier lives. We also know that studies of global public health systems have shown that countries that invest more in social and community programs have better health care outcomes and also have healthier populations. So with these points in mind, my colleague Ellen Albritton and I and several other folks from Academy Health set out to ask a question that we felt few policymakers had, adequ had adequately considered, namely, what can the U.S. learn from innovations in other public health systems? So we reviewed promising practices from around the world. We synthesized the information that we found from a variety of different approaches to public health systems innovations in countries that are bridging their public health, health care, and social service systems to better meet the health needs of their citizens. In the course of doing our scan, we interviewed program managers, administrators, advisors, sponsoring organizations, academics, members of uh, the journalism profession and media, and others who were familiar with the in initiatives. We really want to thank everyone who helped, uh, helped us uh, do this study by taking the time to share their insights with us. We compiled all of our findings into a re report entitled Global Public Health Systems Innovations which is available on our website, academyhealth.org. Our findings suggest that innovations that are anchored in public-private partnerships will stand the best chance of being replicated here in the U.S. There are a few common ingredients that we found that really provided what we thought were winning formulas. First, it's really important to build on a data and communications infrastructure. Most of these initiatives involve, involve dozens of people and they all have to know what everybody else is doing. Second, we found that they were engaging communities in ways that embraced cross-sector solutions in ways that we hadn't necessarily thought about here in the U.S. Third, they all drew on a variety of perspectives from a lot of different communities. And finally, and we know this is really particularly important in the U.S., um, they all made crucial data and information publicly accessible and available to a variety of audiences. Our panel today is going to discuss these lessons and uh, many more that we think can help inform public health systems in the U.S. and we hope can uh, provide us some guidance for initiatives. So without further ado, I'm honored to introduce our panelists and to, and to get the conversation started. So our first uh, panelist today is going to be Dr. Dave Ross, who's director of the Public Health Informatics Institute in Atlanta. He's an accomplished public health professional, has decades of experience in both private and public sectors. Um, he has served as an executive with a private health information systems firm. He's also been a public health service officer at CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. He's been an executive in a private health system. Uh, welcome, Dave. I look forward to your contribution to the conversation. We're also going to hear from Dr. Arpana Verma, who is going to join us from the University of Manchester in the UK. Um, Arpana serves as the director of the Manchester Urban Collaborative on Health in the Center for Epidemiology, which is part of their Institute of Population Health. She has been serving as the principal investigator of the European Urban Health Indicator System Project, or EURHIS, which is a groundbreaking study that resulted in the largest set of individual level urban health indicators in the world. And they have been creating a comprehensive set of health profiles for urban areas throughout the EU, the European Union. Thank you very much for joining us today, Arpana, across the pond. And I know that your colleague, Greg Williams, and, and other colleagues are, are also there with you today. So welcome to all of you. So Dave, um, you were, uh, you've been a good colleague for a long time and are very familiar with the goals of our study. And I'm wondering um, what you would say about the key findings and what those findings might mean for the public health community in the US. So Dave? Sure, Margo. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure to be able to be a part of this uh, hangout. Uh, I, I think I would first say that the findings resonate completely with my experience. Uh, I, as I read the report, uh, when I had nothing really to do with the creation of the report, uh, what I found was my observations over time being validated. So I applaud you and your team for doing it. I applaud RWJ for uh, uh, sponsoring this effort. Because I think it is important that we understand that we have a lot to learn from one another. Uh, I've been saying for some time to colleagues here in the U.S. as I come back from various uh, 
trips to other countries that, gee whiz, there's some really innovative things happening that we in the U.S. public health uh, system should know about and learn from. So, uh, again, your, your report reinforced some of this, but I'll just make a few general comments. One is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Culture of Health Initiative speaks to a theme that I find very central around the world, and that is that even the lowest resource countries understand that a healthy population will, will breed a healthy, vigorous economy that will help all uh, persons. Um, yeah, we're getting a beep in our ears. Uh, but that, that um, improving health is, in fact, uh, a way of advancing uh, national prosperity. And this is a theme that I have found deeply uh, ingrained in almost every one of my uh, institutes and my, my organization, the, the Task Force for Global Health, uh, in, in all of our projects. And so the, the culture of health theme and, and uh, initiative of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation applies generally. I want to make a comment, too, about many of the innovations. Your report spoke to uh, 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 several of them. Uh, I think I've seen uh, some of these same examples. We see really innovative use of mobile technologies for gathering data, for involving citizens uh, in, in their health, for helping the, pu the public at large interact with their government in ways that will uh, motivate improvements in health systems. We've been involved in projects where we are able to use these technologies to capture data on individual services and have those reflected within minutes to hours at the, la at the longest delay to help both the partners in the Ministry of Health, the funding partners, the, the program partners, uh, be aware of this, the, the activities taking place and their impact. That's the kind of innovation that I think we in the U.S. need to see happening and start to learn from it. So I, I think, again, your study speaks to a very important finding. Uh, and then the other, one other comment would be about multi-sectoral collaboration. That's becoming very fundamental in many countries, and in the U.S. we have at times struggled with that. I think we can learn something from them, uh, from other countries, and I think they can learn from us. Uh, I think at this point, I'll turn back to you. I don't want to just occupy the airwaves, but we can talk more about these themes. Well, thanks very much, Dave, for getting us started. And I know you've got a lot of experience in comparing the U.S. and global health systems. So thank you very much for sharing your insights. I'd like to turn now to Arpana um, in Manchester. Um, you are familiar with our public health system, I think, but also very familiar with uh, 20 countries in the EU that were participants in the URHES project. And one of the burning questions that we have for you is whether you would say that they have all uh, since they're EU members, do they have a similar approach to defining and measuring urban health? So, Arpana? Thank you, Margot, and thank you for including us in this important discussion. Uh, we found your report really revealing as well, and some of the um, comments I, that um, have been um, passed on in the first few minutes are quite pertinent to what we found. Um, and in terms of the member states um, in the EU, uh, we found quite different things happening and it was interesting to compare East and West Europe in terms of the way that um, policy, finance and evidence-based policy decisions are being made. Um, there were very many similarities in terms of um, some of the constraints um, that are there converting the huge amounts of data um, that may be um, collated and um, used into policy into real information and evidence that policymakers can use. And I think that one of the key things that um, Dave has said um, about multi-sectoral action and partnership working for health is fundamental to a lot of um, the challenges that we see in our urban areas and um, being able to work across 
um, the different sectors for um, what is going to determine the health and well-being of our citizens is uh, fundamental to making things better. And some of the lessons that we learnt um, were around um, best practice and we were able to share a lot of the findings with our colleagues to be able to make that happen in terms of data collection. So one of the key things that we found was where data wasn't being collected and um, a lot of our partners um, were able to demonstrate the importance of collecting health data at individual level to be able to feed that back to their policy makers to be able to get that into their work program and by showing how health actually is important to all sorts of different sectors from housing, um, transport um, and also the economy um, I think is a real um, facet of working in a vibrant city and fundamental to um, improving their health. Thanks very much Arpana. You've really inspired us I think with the scale and the variability of the findings that you have in your project. Um, so thanks to Dave and Arpana uh, for sharing some of your insights. I'd, I'd like to begin opening up the conversation to our live audience. We are still trying to get Dr. David Fleming in Seattle connected to the Hangout. So um, we're keeping our fingers crossed about that. Sorry about the connectivity problems, but we do have Dave and Arpana with us. And we'd also like now to get all of you involved. So you can please submit your questions through the Google Hangout chat function on your screen or you can tweet at us using hashtag globalpophealth. So one of the things that I'd like to do while we're waiting to hear from all of you folks out there is to talk to you a little bit about uh, the background of our study and to let you know that we use the WHO health systems framework in our study and that used a, a framework that many of you might be familiar with. It's not one that we use here in the US but we found it very helpful in looking at the importance of leadership and governance, financing, information systems and communication, and also in members of the workforce in creating and sustaining innovations. So what I'd like to do now is uh, to start with the panel, get their reactions to some of the specific findings in our study, and we're waiting for all of you to be uh, tweeting and, and uh, sending us questions through the Hangout. So I'd like to start with uh, talking about leadership and governance. One of the first interviews that we did when we were conducting this study was with PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. We were particularly interested in a project um, that the Brazilians have um, in, uh, in their Ministry of Health as well as PAHO, and it's called the Innovations Laboratory. And it's something that is carried out by a lot of middle managers and people who are close to communities across the country. PAHO's role is primarily, in addition to funding, is technical assistance and support but they work more behind the scenes. So uh, Dave Ross, let me turn to you first. Um, what do you think are some of the main challenges in developing partnerships, particularly for Americans who are working in global settings? I Dave? think that, uh, yes. Um, I, I, I have found that one of the most significant uh, challenges for uh, American Americans working in, in other countries is that they're usually working through uh, a, a funding mechanism. So we do a lot of donor-driven work in other countries. And reading, getting to the place where, where the donors' uh, objectives are able to be synchronized with, with country objectives. It's an interesting phenomenon. It's actually quite similar to what we experience in the U.S., where we might have federal government funding, funding state and local public health, but state and local public health goals and objectives might vary a bit from what the federal funding partner thinks is important. Helping to, to recognize those differences and then accommodate them up at the, at the front of, of an effort is really important. It's often not done. And I think the failure to be clear about what we're trying to do together is a, it becomes a barrier for, for us that work in other countries, but it's also a barrier in, in our own country. So if you're going to have a partnership, I think our lesson is, is that clear goals, understanding the first mile and the last mile is very important. 
Mm -hmm. This is something that Dr. Bill Feige, the founder of our organization, has spoken a lot about. Mm -hmm. But if you are willing to be clear about the final mile at the beginning, then you are going to start to be able to formulate a strong partnership. Uh, when, when people enter into a partnership with, with unclear understanding, it's, it might, makes it much easier to dissolve the partnership when the, when the going gets tough. Dave, thanks. Those are great suggestions, and I have a feeling that we're getting some of our live tweeting is going to have that phrase, the last mile. Um, Arpana, let's turn back over to you. You have been managing partnerships in EU countries, and you've been developing a common set of indicators across many different jurisdictions. So what do you think are the challenges in partnerships, and do you have any particular strategies that you use to bring people to consensus? Yes, it, it's a really um, important question and I think that one of the key things is that shared goal and vision as, as Dave said, um, to know the end point is um, absolutely fundamental to both get buy-in and um, ensure that um, we're working together for the best possible um, outcome of any discussions. And I think that um, the diversity is a strength um, in the partnership work and um, the heterogeneity that we um, see within uh, both um, our countries and our cities within the EU um, is one of the core um, reasons behind the success of the project. And being able to really start off with um, a nice body of literature to um, base our discussions on was crucial to really make sure that what we were proposing and recommending um, was the right first steps. And then we were able to bring on board um, various different scientific advisors and um, it probably more importantly um, lay people into our discussions so that we could really ensure that whatever we were doing um, was appropriate for them and having um, our politicians both local um, and regional was fundamental to be able to really show how best to demonstrate our results and mm -hmm. uh, ensure that we had some effects from that. That's a great answer. Thanks, Arpana. So you, you take an evidence-based approach and look at the science um, to come to agreement. Uh, we actually have a question for you from the Festival of Public Health UK. And Dave Ross, I'm going to ask you to, to address this question as well in just a moment. The question is, we've talked a lot about finding common ground and using evidence to unify people. But, but how do you get around when individual sectors have their own goals and maybe their conflicting goals? So Arpana, how, can you give us an example of when you were able to bring some people to harmonize some goals that were conflicting at the beginning? Um, That's a hard so, question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's always that one um, issue that really comes out um, in quite a few of the various different projects that we run. And I think that it's nothing that's going to be surprising to anybody and I think that the um, intuitive nature of a lot of public health is um, one of the key features as to why it's so necessary and inherent in a lot of the systems, even though people don't always know it, but everyone at some stage is doing public health. Um, however, the various um, approaches to deal with these very big population-based problems can be diverse and I think one of the key things is to bring all of the various approaches and um, the different um, ways that people think about tackling a problem and having a very open discussion um, is key to it and within um, the different personalities being able to embrace um, a lot of the um, viewpoints uh, within a structured discussion um, where you have um, a time-limited project like ours um, was quite an interesting management um, uh, challenge that we um, had with lots of different people's um, uh, sort of pet subjects being vied against others and trying to um, 
actually prioritise, we um, took that out to the policy makers and the, and the lay people through um, different engagement activities and um, I think that, that there's a number of steps that you can do from having that open discussion, an open methodology and then taking it back to the people who are then fundamentally going to be um, faced with dealing with those um, different decisions that we're going to be making in terms of the data collection or transfer from um, epidemiology into policy. That's really the voice of experience. I think you can tell that you've uh, you've been in a lot of public meetings and have, uh, I think, probably a very high degree of skill in terms of balancing uh, different priorities. Dave Ross, I've seen you in action. I know you also are very good at balancing different priorities. Do you have any particular strategies that you use to help bring people to consensus? We're very inclusive in public health and priority setting is a real challenge. So what, what are some of the strategies that you have used? Uh, Margo, one of the strategies we use is to start with the proposition that we have more in common than we have in difference. And to uh, urge people to first say, well, we seem to be at some disagreement. Let's see if we can actually get very clear about our goals. Uh, and the way we often do that is to start to break down the areas of work that we're all talking about to try to be clear what it is we, we think we're doing and what we're trying to achieve. As you do that, often you will find that people can come together around statements of significant goals. Where they may diverge is on more narrow, short-term uh, uh, goals, or maybe they've got some preconceived notions about how to achieve those goals. So if we can clarify what we're actually uh, agreeing about or disagreeing about that helps. But the way we often do that is to help people see that they're frequently trying to accomplish mostly the same things and that the, on the whole they mostly do it the same way. Our obser my observation has been people tend to look for what's different about them than the other person or, or the other locale. So for example We've done projects, multi-country projects, to develop uh, information requirements that you would think like, my goodness, how could you align, uh, say, the vaccine uh, distribution systems of Vietnam and Kenya and Senegal, uh, the very diverse countries, different languages, how could you do that? But when you help people say, well, we think we all agree what we're trying to do is make sure we have sufficient vaccine stock at every locale when it's needed so all the, the, the children get properly immunized, people would say, well, yeah, that is the goal. And, and so we frequently have done those kinds of projects that help people be clear about what they're trying to achieve. And, and you start to erase the difference and see more of the commonality. So my number one request to everybody is to look for what's common before they look for what's different. Thanks Dave. So agree on a big idea and then you can uh, find your own ways to solve the problems that everybody has in common. Thank you, that was really helpful. Um, we've been getting some questions about financing so let's turn to that in our discussion. Um, in our study we did a with the interviews that we conducted we talked a lot about whether making sure that funding was sufficient that the funding cycles were realistic, that the uh, donors as well as the people who are accepting the funding were accountable to each other and that uh, above all that citizens, citizens were engaged. And I'd like to give one example from our report. That's the Ouagadougou partnership which came from a conference that involved uh, family planning in uh, and eight uh, West African Francophone country delegations met at the conference and decided that they wanted to make sure that they could commit their ministries of health um, to funding uh, family planning. So the Hewlett Foundation came in and um, built an organization to support civil society capacity hold, to hold the governments accountable for those commitments. So that's one example. Again, it was a big idea um, across several different countries with people on the ground agreeing um, on, on what they were trying to accomplish in terms of family planning. So Arpana, maybe you could uh, Tell us a little bit about the funding for the Euro Urhes project. I know it was in several phases and it was highly complex, but we did talk about this on the phone during our interview. 
I'm wondering if you could tell our audience a little bit about how you were able to manage the different funding cycles for the different phases of your project. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think it's um, very opportune to mention um, that the EU um, has been um, very forward thinking on um, health indicators and developed um, a European system at country level that went down to regional level and then eventually the first part of our project was funded um, for city level indicators um, and that was um, by the Directorate General um, involved with public health. Um, for the second part um, we were then funded by a different section that was the Directorate General for Research and Innovation um, and um, the key um, rationale behind that was because uh, we were now starting to think about how to really put indicators into um, the research arena to be basically learn and um, be able to influence health and it's um, very important for me to mention our fantastic collaborators um, who um, really did all of the hard work both here in Manchester and um, all across the EU um, and they um, basically collated the data and helped us in every stage of the of the program to be able to do the work and um, myself with the project management team um, we were able to really draw on all of their expertise and um, DG research were absolutely fantastic at being able to do that um, through the funding mechanism that um, is now um, called Horizon 2020 and um, we're very fortunate that um, that was um, something that we were able to do in a systematic way to allow the comparisons to happen. Thank you very much. Uh, what a, a large-scale project. I'm, I'm going to turn over to Dave Ross uh, to react to what you've just told us, Arpana, and ask about how you think that compares to funding for public health systems here in the U.S. Well, yeah, it's quite, in a way, quite different than what we experience in the U.S. Uh, I do think, though, that one of the things that Arpana said that is applying more here in the U.S., is a move towards uh, being transparent in what we are in the financing related to our work and associating that financing with the outcomes of that work. Uh, the, this has been a struggle for a lot of people over a long period of time to try to agree on uh, how to do that in a way that, that doesn't penalize people but actually spurs progress. I think we are seeing, uh, both in the U.S. And, and globally, a trend towards using data to create transparency in a way that brings about uh, mutually held, um, it's sort of a collaborative approach to accountability. Uh, we've got one project we're doing with neglected tropical diseases right now that brings together both the the donators of drugs, the pharmaceutical com companies, the NGOs that are implementers, the countries, and the foundation that, that do a lot of that work to create a, a uh, framework for uh, and in effect a dashboard that all can see so we can hold ourselves mutually accountable. In the U.S., there is an effort that has been going on, uh, also supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where we are looking at the finances, uh, the, the actual expenditures and revenues associated with public health work, and over time we hope build a way to associate that with uh, the outcomes of the work, both the, the direct outputs of public health work, but over time the real outcomes, so that we can start to have some uh, better handle on what it takes in the way of spending to produce the results that matter. So. I think, again, this is an area where we in the U.S. can learn a lot from the Eurozone, and I think in a project-by-project project way, we can learn from other countries. Thanks, Dave, very much. I think that was really helpful. Um, we now have a question from Twitter, 
Um, so the question is, prevention doesn't get headlines, so how do we persuade more funders that it should get funding? Um, Dave, could you take that on and then we'll turn to Arpana? Uh, yes, that is that is the lifelong uh, problem of public health work uh, and will remain so, but let me give you one example of things that are changing right now. The, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa has made many people, many uh, very high-level decision makers around the world aware of the need to invest in surveillance and basic primary care infrastructure. What is that? Well, that is investing in prevention. We are, if nothing else, the Ebola episode has shown that it pays huge dividends to invest in a basic public health surveillance infrastructure, which is a preventive infrastructure, than to wait for the fire to, to overcome the entire forest. Uh, Bill Gates actually published uh, on Wednesday in the New England Journal of Medicine a perspectives article arguing this case. And I would urge all of, all of you to read that, find that article. Uh, he pointed out in that uh, journal article the basic ways in which the core public health processes lead to prosperity and are needed to protect the public. So I think what we have to do is use these opportunities to help uh, leaders around the world understand what they're investing in so that when we're not having problems, they understand the benefit of that is that it's because in great part the infrastructure of mm -hmm. uh, public health prevention is in place. Thanks, Dave. So, uh, so I'm going to ask uh, another question about infrastructure and communications um, and informatics, um, which is certainly your area. And I, Arpana, you and I have talked about this before, too. So uh, during this study, uh, one of the things that Ellen and I got very excited about was a project in Uganda called U-Report, which is funded by UNICEF. And it, it has about 200, Uganda has about 270,000 teens who are signed up um, to get free SMS-based texts, it's a week, kind of a weekly polling device, and that is their that becomes their uh, workforce to help track what's going on in in villages across the country. Um, we have a some pe some people in this country call that citizen science. Um, so I'm wondering, Arpana, if you I know that the European Union has um, has done a lot of work with electronic health records. Could you tell us a little bit about whether you have any kind of uh, citizen science projects um, anywhere in the projects that you looked at and then I will also ask Dave if he could talk a little bit more about the work that PHII does in that space. So Arpana first. Uh, yeah, we um, absolutely believe in a citizen scientist approach to a lot of the various things that we're currently working on uh, from community assets and um, being able to really get down to the um, rationale and the reasons how to make um, lives better and reduce inequalities is completely um, um, using the citizen science approach and um, empowering uh, both uh, leadership and communities um, to be able to um, self-determine so things aren't done to them but with them and um, interventions that are um, designed by them are absolutely fundamental. Um, we have quite a large program of work um, for um, patient and public involvement um, and that's really fundamental in um, applying for research grants now so a lot of um, the preparatory work is making sure that um, from the design stage we have um, consulted with and taken on board comments from um, either patient groups or public groups to be able to inform um, both our strategy and our methodology and then having them as part of the scientific advisory team. Um, now for all of our health and well-being services um, patients are um, invited onto those groups and it's a statutory duty now really to have um, the um, population served um, in terms of being able to um, influence uh, uh, the design of research and the evaluation process. And then um, we also um, have quite a 
large programme of work by where we offer opportunities for um, lay people to come to our conferences um, so that um, they can get to meet these fantastic inspirational um, scientists who are really leading the way and um, be able to have a voice and ask questions and I, I, I again feel that um, the um, language that we use um, to be able to communicate is absolutely fundamental so that we are inclusive mm -hmm. of everybody so that we can try and work out why these disparities and the inequalities are occurring within our cities and sometimes these disparities are larger in our cities than between our cities and again I think mm -hmm. this is one of the key things from what Dave said it's what brings us all together um, in that we all have the same sorts of issues and it doesn't matter if we're talking about Manchester or Kampala we've actually got um, a lot of the um, health outcomes being affected through socio-economic reasons rather than um, the um, health care and I think the prevention question is absolutely fundamental because uh, we know the ancient Romans believed that prevention was much better than cure and we have a fixation on high technology and a lot of the things that have come about through um, the 20th century and the 21st century innovations in health care and we've almost forgotten a lot of the basic principles that um, our ancestors were thinking about 2000 years ago and so bringing it back to basics is something that the population are teaching us and telling us what to do and being um, able to put the power back into their hands is absolutely crucial for anything to work. Very well said, thank you so much Arpana. I think if uh, Dr. David Fleming were here, he would also certainly agree with your point about differences in health status varying within cities, often more than they do across cities or across regions. Very important point. He has a lot of data when he was the health officer in Seattle and King County to, to document those, those uh, differences, those disparities. So Dave Ross, what's your reaction to what Arpana has said in terms of some of the things that we're doing here in the U.S.? Uh, well, uh, yeah. I resonate with what Arpana said. I think um, there are some in incredibly compelling examples of uh, citizen involvement in other countries that we in the US could learn from that might also help spur and motivate uh, more direct involvement and almost a, 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 reno a, a reformation of uh, citizen involvement in health here in the US that, that I think is needed. Let me give you one example of, of work our uh, organization has done. Over the last 27 years, we've run a program uh, in partnership with Merck where they donate a, a, a drug called Mectazan to treat a disease called river blindness. And over the last 27 years, we are moved to uh, eliminating this disease in, in the Americas and almost now all of Africa, and we're within a few years of eliminating it uh, uh, from the face of the earth. That program runs mostly with citizen involvement as volunteers. And why does that work? They actually act as the distributors and the organizers. It's because it is done in deep partnership with them and their governments, their villages, the leadership of the villages, and with uh, their own enlightened self-interest. So it is a program that was built on at its basic foundation around the notion that this can only work if you, the beneficiaries of the, of the service, are deeply involved. And it has worked marvelously. It is largely volunteer, and it will lead to an eradication of a disease. We, we ought to, in the U.S., I think, take examples like that, highlight them to our own public so that they are aware that, uh, gee whiz, other people do some pretty exciting things uh, just by mobilizing your own community. And I think we, we have a lot to learn here in the U.S. or, or maybe to relearn. So we have done this at times, but we need to, to do that uh, community by community in, in our cities. 
Thanks, Dave. I think you've given us some really inspiring words, I think, for the, the kind of work that can continue here in the U.S. Um, unfortunately, that's really all the time we have right now. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dave Ross and Arpana Verma for joining us and David Fleming for trying to join us. I'm sorry we were never able to resolve those technical challenges, but David, you certainly were here in spirit and that you contributed so much to this study in terms of your role on the advisory group. So as we've uh, clearly seen today, there are just many, many topics to explore when it comes to building successful public health systems here in the U.S. and around the world. And we really hope that this is just the beginning of a conversation with all of you on Twitter. So please continue to share your thoughts with us at our Twitter handle, at Academy Health. Thank you all for joining us, and have a great day. Happy first day of spring. Thank you.